Hello, I'm Simon Fisher-Becker, and you're listening to the Sirens of... Oh, sh- What was it? Oh, we'll keep that. We'll keep that one. <laughs> That's going on. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Sirens of audio, I'm really sorry. <laughs> G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. My name is Philip. And my name is Dwayne. Oh, I didn't throw you. I was trying (laughs) so hard too. How are you, Philip? Good. I'm also not Dwayne, I'm Philip. Hey, I'm well, g'day audiophiles, good to be here. Oh, all our audience knows that. They all know that. They know who we are now. You've got the lovely rich dose of tones. You know what I do for this podcast? I love it so much that I've been away on a vacation and I've left mid-vacation to come home to record this. You've left for your mid-vacation because your wife was bidding your cards too much. Oh, you saw that. You saw me <laughs> post that. I saw you post uh, on Facebook. I saw you being wiped clean by your wife. I was actually going to come home from our campsite and uh, go back out tonight, but she decided to come with me. So there goes all my... Oh, free well, alone back. time. And I assume you brought the kids with you too, then. And the kids. Oh, so good. I, was, I didn't even. The, 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 the I was madly trying there. to madly trying to put them to bed before we before we came on for this podcast. But anyway, we've got a fantastic show lined up tonight. We're going to be speaking with one of the newer authors from Big Finish, James Kettle, and uh, he's done not a great deal of stories, but boy, the stories that he has done have made an impact on us. And we want to talk to him about those, and hopefully, they'll have a bit of an impact on you as well. Philip. Indeed, and he's got a fascinating background because he's a comedy writer. So he writes for most the um, mm. some of the great comedians in uh, Britain, and he's been yeah working uh, doing that sort of work and has come across to be finished. So it's a very different background to most big finished writers. Here's a bit of trivia for you, Philip. Uh, not including Nev Fountain, can you think of another comedy famous comedy writer that's written for uh, Big Finish? Not 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 Nev Fountain, not Mark Gatiss. There you go. Oh, I was going to say Mark Gatiss. So that's uh-huh. a shame. I just thought of <laughs> who, him. Who else? Okay, the the one I'm thinking of. Okay, he's American. Go for American. You think of him? No, um, time's up. You yep. missed the buzzer. I mean, Rob uh, Sheeman's funny, but he's not actually a comedy well, writer. He's, not, he's not a. Yeah, he's more absurdist than comedy. <laughs> I would say. Uh, the the story I'm thinking of is a story, a Fifth Doctor story called The Game, which was written by Darren Henry who is a comedy writer he wrote for Seinfeld. Really? I, yep. I didn't realise that. One of the... He was in the later series of Seinfeld. And do you remember the story I'm talking about? It was actually William it's, Russell's they, first appearance uh, for Big Finish. And he was playing... Uh, he was... What was he playing? Was it a villain? He was a kind of a villain. Sort of a villain? I think it was a Ian. doctor's old friend that turned out to be a... It wasn't Ian. It was a different character. Yeah. It's been a very long time since I've listened to the game. Wow. And what was... Uh, also interesting about that story was that the episodes were only about 15 to maximum 20 minutes long. It was a six-part story. So Yes, I do remember that. You remember that? So yep. that, that could be a could be a recommendation. Go back and listen to The Game it could by indeed. Darren well, Henry. You, that, that's impressive trivia off the top of your head, Dwayne. I've never forgotten because I've always been a huge Seinfeld fan and I, I love that story. Always did. Okay, fantastic. We're not going to jump in the rabbit hole today because James, I believe, has a lot to talk about. So, <laughs> I believe he does. We're going to get straight into the interview uh, right after we have a listen to a trailer for the first box set that he worked on, which was a River Song box set. I'll throw in a trailer for that. Uh, the story he wrote was called Barrister to the Stars. Uh, after you hear the trailer, we'll come back with James in a moment. From Big Finish Productions, The Diary of River Song, Series 7. It's the third body we found on your beach. I should complain. As you said... It looks bad. You can tell me, what are you ill with? Did someone do this to you? You miss! Just... Hello? 
her, her skin. What is that? It's shimmering. I don't know. Oh, foolish girl. She must have already been feeling unwell. Do you see the spectre of a brother monk, Sister Melody? All things considered, I prefer the vengeful ghosts to the enigmatic ones. Unauthorized user detected. Decontamination activated. No, no, don't you dare. Now, it's absolutely vital that you tell me everything, while at the same time telling me nothing that I ought not to know. May the day dawn bright and cheerfully. Well, I certainly hope so. How's that pesky murder of yours going? Oh, time-consuming. I have taken my place with my ancestors, all of the finest warriors of the Ferox race. Bow down before my majesty, you abhorrent scum! Run! Professor Tom, as your legal representative, I really cannot recommend you fleeing your trial. This isn't fleeing, it's running away. When Dean gets going, the results can be shocking. I saw myself get murdered, kid. I watched myself die. You gotta believe me. <laughs> That's impossible. Quick, look back. So close, just a bit further. Run! I suspect some very old friends. By old friends, you really mean deadly enemies? Big finish. We love stories. I've got my eye on you, Angel. And by all that is sacred, I will stare you down. Big finish. I've been introducing lots of new writers into the mix recently. And one of the ones that's been really exciting to uh, get a lot of stories from in a short period of time and a very large range of tones is our guest today. So welcome, James Kettle. Hi. Thanks for uh, joining us today. I oh, know, really real pleasure to be asked. I mean, you 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 put these things together uh, in terms of scripts and uh, it's it's great to feel that people are kind of responding to them and wanting to kind of find out more and uh, you know, are enthusiastic enough to ask questions. So thank you. No, yeah, thank you very much. Now, why don't we start with just um do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself? Um where are you? Where you grew up? Um, and how did you decide to start writing? Uh, okay, so right now, uh, I, I mean, I'm living in Folkestone. Uh, this is, this is where, where I live. It's, uh, for listeners outside the UK, it's kind of at the sharp end of Brexit. Um, where I am is uh, about a five-minute walk from motorways that could easily become choked with lorries when uh, the Channel Tunnel is uh, needing more paperwork to be checked. So uh, it's, a kind of, it's, it's, it's become a, a very interesting kind of place to live in the last couple of years. Um, uh, I don't really have a sort of a, um, uh, uh, a home base in, in the UK in terms of, a, oh, I feel I come from here or there. I'm, I'm, I'm a services kid. My, my dad was a naval officer. So we kind of moved around a lot when I was a kid. And I don't have a sort of a, a strong regional origin um, here. In terms of writing, I guess, um, writing has always been something that I don't want to say it kind of came easily to me. Uh, it's more, I guess, a kind of an aptitude. Um, like I play the bass guitar. I'm, I'm not a natural uh, musician at all. So when I'm playing the bass guitar, everything I'm doing, I'm learning mechanically and gradually working out how to do it like a kind of someone learning a foreign language. But I know there are people, musicians, to whom these things are kind of, they're not born musically uh, wholly proficient, but they have a tendency towards being able to find these things easier to do. They have a natural aptitude for it. I have always had, a, I guess, a natural aptitude for putting words in kind of nice orders and I suppose sort of imitating what I read. Um, I've always been able to kind of mimic um, writing very easily um, to sort of pastiche. And even as a kid, I would kind of, I would, I would love to sort of write stories that emulated the writers that I really loved and, and, and the people that I really wanted to be. So for me, that was Douglas Adams, um, obviously a, a Who connection there, um, but also in comedy, um, Peter Cook and particularly um, Richard Curtis were, were people that I desperately wanted to be. And so as a kid, and I'm talking like kind of seven, eight years old, I was sort of writing and writing and writing and desperately trying to kind of emulate these, these sort of people. And that kind of flair, I guess, for, for, for pastiche, um, if, 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 if one can say that one has a, uh, a flair without 
sounding incredibly sort of um, self-congratulatory is something that's kind of like part of my writing to this day. I mean, when I write a lot with stand-up comedians and, and, and with that, that's often a case of sort of ventriloquizing them at trying to kind of emulate their voice and write jokes and routines that will seem like they come naturally from inside their head. And in a Doctor Who space, it's very much, you know, you're, you're, you're taking on the stories and the heritage that have existed for, you know, more than 50 years and trying to kind of re-fuse them into new and exciting different ways. So I'm, I'm drawing again on that kind of um, aptitude for um, imitation and recreation and, and changing things. Yeah. Now, you, you, your main career has actually been in comedy writing. So how, That's do, right, you, yeah. how, how do you get into that? So when I was a teenager and going to university, I kind of, it, I, it kind of began to think that, you know, trying to be Richard Curtis was probably not a, um, a sensible kind of career move, um, but mainly because there already was one. So I started to sort of think, well, what, what can I do with words that will allow me to kind of have a, have a, have a career? And, and, and so I was sort of thinking about stuff like journalism and advertising, and that was kind of where I sort of gravitated to um, professionally. But I, but I didn't enjoy either of them as much as I'd, I'd kind of hoped. And what I really enjoyed was making people laugh. And I'm talking really sort of socially, um, I used to enjoy um, making my friends laugh at dinner parties. And it, it eventually dawned on me that that was something that I could maybe kind of do in the real world by um, writing jokes and writing comedy scripts. So I began sort of, I began doing a bit of stand up comedy on stage myself, not good at it, uh, <laughs> abandoned that after a couple of years. But um, the other thing I did, and this will seem very familiar to you from talking to Nev Fountain, is that I sent stuff into BBC Radio and they gave me, like they did him, uh, a year's deal uh, to go and work in uh, the radio comedy department, writing scripts for various different radio shows. From there, I started building relationships with particular comedians. Um, and I don't know how much these names mean to uh, Australian uh, audience, but... Um, Miles Jupp uh, and Joe Lyson and Jack Whitehall, the people I work with a lot, began running some shows on, on radio and moved from there into, into TV. And that's kind of sort of brought, brought, brought me to where, where I am, sort of working with comics generally on, on TV projects, helping them realise their, their visions and, and, and also trying to you know, get away my own sort of self-penned um, narrative ideas. So, so in terms of structuring humour, I mean, um, I mean, Joe Lice is the person I know out of those three the best. Um, oh, great. Tends to be very sharp, quite biting, um, satirical. I mean, but how do you how do you decide this is this is what's going to be funny? This is what I'm going to how I'm going to write for this person. Is that, do you meet with them a lot? Yeah, yeah. It's it, you, you really want to kind of get inside their heads. I mean, all all three of those guys we've talked about, I've spent significant amounts of time kind of sitting in a room staring at a wall with, and finding out. Some of it is just about finding out what makes them laugh, and you know, saying stuff to them, seeing what response it gets. But but listening to the way they talk and the way they make jokes, I. When you talk about kind of working with a stand-up comedian, it's sort of, it, you're never kind of like, um, it's not that you're putting words into their mouth or, or, or kind of um, acting like a puppeteer. It's working with the incredibly sort of strong and distinctive comic voice that they have and helping them kind of fill the shows that they're making uh, and make that feel kind of distinctively them. I often kind of compare it to like um, being like a Barocca. Uh, you know, the vitamin, um, it's yeah. helping them be them, but on a really good day. So like a, like a kind of a, um, uh, a creative valet in a way, like kind of just sort of facilitating making their voice work for the show. So as a kid, did you watch lots of comedy? Is that oh God, yeah. Okay, and all, yeah, all of the amounts. 
So what, what was what was your passion as a kid? So you, you've mentioned Richard Curtis and that, but I mean, so more things like the Richard Curtis made in terms of the sitcoms and things, or yeah, I mean the Blackadder shows, yeah. um, but also um, uh, Python, uh, The Goodies, um, Lee and Herring, loads and loads, Father Ted, all of the Alan Partridge, uh, Harry Enfield. I spent my teenage years, yeah, basically watching comedy and watching Doctor Who and Blake Seven. That was kind <laughs> of, um, you know, vis- that 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 was my TV. Um, I I, ne- I didn't watch soaps, um, and I can't say that I really kind of um, spent the nineties watching uh, Our Friends in the North or or things like that. It was it was it was all about uh, a Doctor Who, Blake Seven, and comedy until. I would say until Queer as Folk and Queer as Folk was a show that kind of made me go, oh, wow, you can do like really great drama that's kind of funny, but is also filled with incidents and hugely uh, deeply felt emotions and things like that. And that Queer as Folk was a really kind of transformative thing for me. Like my excitement about Doctor Who coming back in 2005 was twofold because I wasn't just a Doctor Who fan I was also a massive Queer as Folk fanboy so the idea that those things were coming together and Russell running the show was tremendously exciting and kind of you know and for me the 2005 series totally delivered on that it it was just from the moment that began I was just blown away And, and, and from a period in my teens where I'd kind of been less super involved in, in in thinking about Doctor Who, getting more into music and chasing girls and drinking beer and things like that. From the moment that Rose began, I was right back to being uh, nine years old and, 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 and loving and living for Doctor Who, uh, you know, every every waking moment. So when, when did you first get into Doctor Who? So I have a, I have a memory of being terrified of the um, titles for would have been Trial of a Time Lord. Um, I would have been three or four, but and, and that sort of scared me away from the show for a couple of years. But the first, the first episode I saw in them was Silver Nemesis Part One, which is a terrible uh, <laughs> way to begin watching Doctor Who. But then watched every episode to the end of the series. And being a little kid, I had no idea after Survival that that the show had finished. And it got to kind of autumn 1990, and I was just checking the paper, going, oh, Doctor Who's going to be starting again soon. And, and it never came, ever came back. So, so that was my kind of, um, that was my kind of initiation. But I then kind of spent that, the 90s, getting very into the novelizations, the VHS tapes were coming out. So I was learning about old doctors, getting very into the behind the scenes minutiae. I'm, I'm, I'm a big kind of, um, nerd for um production process and you know how robert holmes or anthony reed or whoever were going about assembling the scripts and the problems that they had in making them come together i love all of that stuff we, we run a podcast on big finish audios we understand what you're saying yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i i i, I think I, that's that to me has always been a kind of a parallel thread with the kind of the stories of the of, of, of the show is the 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 magic of the behind the scenes process i got involved with sort of local fandom in the uk um and i began my first piece of doctor who fiction uh, would have been when i was about 11 i, I wrote a short story for the local fanzine which was about the seventh doctor um, going on a, a demo about uh, education funding. So there's probably a kind of a, 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 a line between that and the blazing hour uh, <laughs> uh, that I hadn't thought about uh, before. But yeah, so, so I was, I was creating Dr. Who from a, from an early age as well. Okay. So you do lots of creative writing stuff. You've been doing comedy, you've been doing Dr. Who. You mentioned a bit of passion for Blake seven. So how did you get into that one? We used to have the local group in, the local Doctor Who group by the coast in, in, in East Anglia where I was living. And um, it was very strict that you could only talk about Doctor Who um, because they'd, they'd had some issues with people talking about the next generation um, and that caused some bad feeling in the group. So but you could talk about Blake Seven if you went outside. If you went outside <laughs> in the car park, you could talk about Blake Seven. So 
as a kid, you're like, oh, what people talk about in the car park? And so you kind of go and you end up so someone's like passing you a tape of um, The Keeper and Star One, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna check this out because this is clearly what the cool kids, which is very relative at an East Anglian um, Doctor Who group, <laughs> are, are 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 talking about. Yeah, so that that was my kind of Blake Seven um, initiation. It's all part of that fandom thing. Now, um, so we 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 know you now. Um, for writing for Big Finish, how did you come to write for Big Finish the first time? I had got a, a contact for David Richardson um, from a friend, and I thought, oh, I should I should email him and ask if I can write some Doctor Who. And um, sure enough, uh, seven years later, <laughs> I got around to to sending an email, and and I was kind of like going, well, well, it, should I do it? And should w- will they be interested? And is it is it you know a sensible kind of thing to be doing as a writer and a sensible use of your time? But 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 then I kind of thought you know well look I've, I, you're being very silly because you've got a chance to write Doctor Who with the people who you grew up watching and loving, and that opportunity is not going to be there forever. So you know dip your toe in, get in touch with these guys, and find out what it's like. So I emailed David, and then Matt. Fitton got in touch with me and asked to see a sample, uh, which I sent them. And, and then they were, were kind enough to commission uh, me to write Barrister for the uh, Barrister to the Stars. And from that kind of like uncertainty about what it would be like and whether it was a sensible thing to do, I can say that consistently it's been one of the happiest experiences of my entire professional life. Um, that of course there are sort of moments where you have like, notes you don't 100% agree with or kind of, um, you know, anxieties about getting things finished on time or sorting out story issues. But but the general m- mean of my interactions with, with Big Finish and the process of writing these things has been so unbelievably positive and happy that I can't speak highly enough of them as a company but also the individuals, I and mean, David as, 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 as the main producer I've dealt with, but uh, uh, Matt, John, uh, 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 Peter on Blake Seven, you know, just just great people to deal with a, 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 a kind of a, a story level. So supportive, thoughtful. I'm sure they're going to give you more work anyway. <laughs> well, after all of that, I hope so, yeah. I mean, what's the point in laying it on that thing? No, we hear it all the time, which is lovely, lovely to know. Now, your first work was Barrister for the Stars. Now, I must admit, a lot of new writers come and go, and, or it takes me a few stories before I actually notice someone's new. And you actually stood out. So Barrister for the Stars, to me, was just this standout story. Because, I mean, I love River Song, and mm. I just laughed and laughed throughout the entire thing. It was so cleverly constructed, and then the, the twist at the end. Um, yeah, what was the whole process in terms of how did... How did I guess were you happy to get about you, you wanted to write for Doctor Who, you got a river song. Were you happy with that? that, that happening oh, God, yeah, because because I mean, the two the 2000, you know, Russell and Stevens stuff, you know, I, I sort of see as kind of so intermingled in, in that, you know, obviously Stephen was writing when 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 Russell was was running the show. And and, and it's a sort of to me. I, I kind of see it as a sort of a shared creative heritage, and 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 and, and River Songs. You kind of came out, you know, came out of that in, in 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 serious force. So to to be to have one of those kind of like toys to play with in terms of that character, yeah, thrilled. And then yeah, Barrister to the Stars um, is a sort of it's. It, 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 I was thinking about it last night as a kind of it's it's like a sort of a first album um, type script, and I wanted to kind of do everything. Um, and really show a lot of fireworks in terms of my approach to science fiction, my uh, view of who. Um, And so it's filled with lots of different aliens, very kind of end of the world type um, situation and lots of kind of ideas, um, uh, comic and dramatic ideas. I, I had the advantage on that one that, that Matt had said, you know, for this box set, we're going for um, uh, things inspired by crime dramas as a structural thing. And so I was able to play on that kind of um, courtroom drama structure. 
as a way of sort of organising it, which was which was really helpful. It's it's sort of school of Rumpole of the Bailey. I mean, Hodgkiss isn't isn't a kind of an exact Rumpole, but he's of that sort of lineage, yeah. the kind of the colourful advocate. Um, and that that was a really nice character to play off um, River, who's so sort of straight down the line, non flowery and uh, subversive with someone who is, is, is also subversive, but in a more kind of roundabout, procedural, august kind of way. I thought it was a nice, a nice duo. One of the things I found with, 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 with that was, was I hadn't really appreciated it beforehand, was the chance to kind of go and watch the recording. And, and we've had less of a chance to do that uh, with, the, with the pandemic, but to kind of go and, and, and you know, meet, Alex and, and and watch her kind of delivering my words and see how much she enjoyed it was you know it was that was a real kind of oh ego nirvana <laughs> <laughs> for the day so uh, that's a strong memory of 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 that story so when you wrote you Matt Fitton was script editing the box set and then yeah. Dave Richards was playing so how many how many notes do a script, does a script editor give you or the producer give you so we talk a lot in advance about about the stories. I mean, for me, the hard work of it is is always in the in the planning. I tend to want to do quite a detailed uh, breakdown for the script. It's more detailed, I think, than they than they would necessarily ask for, and to kind of take a lot of do a bit of toing and froing on that, and. And then I'll, I'll I'll write the draft, do a second pass on it myself, and then see see what they kind of send back. And it and it really varies from kind of story to story, um, both ends of that. I mean, sometimes your treatment can be yeah, they're 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 pretty happy with that straight off. And sometimes we can have quite a bit of like to and fro and some steers in different directions. Generally, for me, that I've gone far too mad on something. Um, I would say that the the, the 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 times when we've kind of like changed direction in midstream have been prior to the scripting process and that planning process where I've just kind of pitched something that's kind of completely bonkers. And there was one um, which my, which we didn't do, we, where, where my initial storyline involved a journey to the centre of the TARDIS where the Doctor discovers a group of actors performing a reenactment of the robots of death <laughs> which I'd sort of pitched as an idea and they were like, yeah, yeah. And then, and then when the treatment, went, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> and so we ended up in a more kind of uh, 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 a place that we were all happy with. So, so that, that happens occasionally, but it's not a kind of a heavy hand on the script editing process. It's in Tiller. It's um, I think that, that, that all the guys are, uh, are very sort of thoughtful about what it is that I'm trying to do. And if I'm setting out with a clear idea of what I'm trying to do, then hopefully I'm not going to veer too far away from that. And so the the process once we're in once we're at the draft stage is pretty straightforward. I mean, sometimes we we talk a bit about hitting the dramatic beats and making sure that our climaxes are, you know, um, pumping along at the most desirable level to give a really satisfying payoff to the listener. But I don't. I don't send these things off in a great sort of fear of like, oh my god, it's going to come back covered in red ink or anything like that. It's um, it's it's quite sympathetic. Mm. Well, here in Australia, it's summer at the moment, and we've just had a wonderful season of cricket, and I believe you like cricket. Yes, so I hear. I haven't watched it myself. But strange, strangely, none of my English friends or relatives have commented this year on the cricket, which you know, I, I don't know why. Um, oh, oh no! I've been commenting a lot. I've been commenting a lot. Um, uh, not necessarily in language that is suitable to be uh, deployed on a a family podcast. <laughs> now, my understanding is you have a passion for the game, but also you've done yeah. some time in Australia. So, your first Doctor Who story, um, you combine those two things. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? So, this would be first episode of Shadow of the Daleks, and this is. I mean, it's atypical in a number of different ways because it's just a single episode and it was written bang at the start of lockdown in 2020. If I remember this correctly, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting the kind of the, 
the, the chain of events. It, it's a big finish. They were kind of going, oh, we've got all of these things that we're, we were about to record. And now we're not entirely sure whether we can record them in the way that we were planning to or when we'll be able to record them and trying to get people's home studios set up and, and, and things like that. So Shadow of the Daleks was kind of conceived as a very quick turnaround stopgap. Um, it was the first one I did with John, um, the first time we'd, we'd spoken. John and Dorney. he kind of got in, John Dorney, yeah. He, he got in touch and said, um, so we're doing this story and we need it like pretty much immediately. Um, but we hear that you might be able to do something like that. There was a lot, John had written the last episode, uh, which I read. Um, so I knew how it was going to end. And that I think is how you do it, that you don't do it the time of the time world way around, but you do everything but the last episode and then don't know what to do. No. Um, so John has <laughs> written the last episode. We had that, we had that to go on. Um, and Bodyline was floating around as uh, a thing in the list of possible ideas. I don't know why. Um, that would be a question for John rather than. Uh, but I, I'd, I'd written a, um, I'd written a feature uh, script on Bodyline that has not and probably never will get made. Um, and so I'd done a lot of reading about it, and I, I said, well, I could do Bodyline. I know, I know a thing or two about it. I could do something with Jardine, Douglas Jardine, the England cricket captain, on that, on that tour as a character i should probably explain what body line is shouldn't i um, uh, it might be worth doing for non-cricket people out there this was an ashes series in the early 30s um where england came over to australia with the kind of the main aim of stopping don bradman who was the and he still is and still is indeed the, the the greatest batsman of of all time. I mean, think Messi times Maradona times Usain Bolt times whatever whatever excellent sportsman you want. But in the field of, of cricket, England's one plan was to was to get this guy somehow. And, and what they did was short pitched bowling at the body with a lot of fielders in close. Um, and the idea being to the idea notionally being to draw a shot, but but effectively to 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 hit the batsman physically. Is that fair, Philip? Yeah, it was it was, it was very nasty, but it was yeah. a, a, interesting times. It wasn't, and, and Douglas Jardine, the England captain at the time, was an absolutely kind of a very very sort of cold fish and a, a quite sort of you know in some ways perhaps kind of brutal seeming man um, that the Australian public did not take to and the hostility was very mutual so he seemed to me to be a kind of an interesting sort of character to stick the doctor with and so shadow of the daleks episode one was storylines and turns around i think within the space of two or three days it was a re it was the fastest process of anything that i've done on on big finish just so there was something then to to work with for the rest of the writers and also to, to, to know that there was something in the bank for people to record. It's a tone piece, really, Shadow of the Darks, episode one. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's relying a lot on spooky voices and the creepy atmosphere. And that thing uh, Paul Cornell said on, on the, the Writer's Room podcast once, it's easy to write the first part of something. And he's absolutely right, because you can just sort of dial up all of the kind of spooky atmosphere and leave every loose end um, untied and get away with it. And uh, Aimed at the Body, that's what it's called. Aimed at the Body is, uh, is kind of a little bit uh, like that. Tons of fun, but leaving a lot of things for other people to, um, to resolve. So in terms of the location, how, how did you choose? Because you didn't use so it on the actual cricket pitch. Um, no, my memory is Blue Mountains, isn't it? It is the Blue Mountains. Yeah, they, they, I saw some people on, online kind of going, so, oh, so where is it in Australia? And I said, well, I thought, well, I put in how many miles from uh, Adelaide it was. Just can draw it, draw, draw it, get a compass out. And yeah, it's, we know we, we know it's a kind of a, a, a mountain a mountain region. Yeah, Blue Mountains. So I I spent a bit of time in, in Australia uh, before university. Um, Sydney, Melbourne, um, some time in, in Alice Springs and uh, Darwin, Cairns, about a bit, not, not in um, Tasmania where, uh, where Dwayne is, um, but, uh, but, but there are quite, some quite, you know, uh, a good cross section of the rest of the country. And I kind of thought, well, 
let's draw on some of that and uh, and, and use it. And I, you know, I apologise to um, any any Australians if I made any any dreadful. Well, I apologise for putting Douglas Jardine in the stories to start with, um, but uh, but I also apologise if I made any kind of howlers. Um, there's a much worse howler in um, in uh, 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 Terror of the Suburbs, but we'll probably get to that. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, Shadow of the Daleks, Volume 1. Hello! Is there anyone out there? I can hear you. Why can't I see you when I can hear you? Mummy, look! Well, that wasn't there a moment ago. You can see it. It's not just me. I've never seen anything like it. Sorry to disturb you. Uh, can I ask for directions? Where on earth did you come from? I was looking for the Adelaide Oval. Are you mocking me, sir? Uh, no need for the sir. I'm the doctor. The last time we toured Australia, the crowds were vile. I vowed then to bring those animals to heal, to overpower their weakness with my strength, until the universe kneels before the might of the Dalek Empire. This is your captain speaking. Welcome to Interstellar Flight B19. Hmm. Well, this all looks perfectly civilized. Not exactly what I'd expect from the Daleks. So, where are they? This is a passenger announcement. If there are any medical professionals on board, could they please come to the bridge immediately? These men were electrocuted. They're dead? Exterminated! So it's happening here, too. There's nothing you can do, Doctor. You can't escape the inevitable. Yes, thank you for that. I knew there was something wrong about him the moment he stumbled in. I mean, he, he seemed confused and helpless. Hello, I, I'm... Oh, dear. But I knew he threatened us all. You're scared because you're getting closer to the window. Why? What's out there? The storm. Yes. A storm. Raging through all of time. A storm or a shockwave. Let him give me a hand with the props, Virgilio. You can concentrate on the words and he can do the acting. Do I have any say in the matter? Very well, Doctor, you're on. Yeah, not bad going, Doctor. Seen Shifter to lead in two minutes. As if I didn't have enough on my mind. Is it just me or has the stage shrunk? Not to mention the room. So much for Doctor Theatre. Big finish. We love stories. Not again. Can't breathe. Oh, he's off again. I grew up in the Blue Mountains, so I was, even though no Tasmania, I'm, we did have the cricket this week in Tasmania, so that's that's at least something. But um, yeah, yeah it, I get very excited any time there's a story set somewhere where I live or have, or have been, so... Now you've got to write a story set in Alice Springs. Oh, that'd be great. I mean, I love, I love like, um, you know, the song lines, the British Chatwin book about um, Uluru and the, and the Aboriginal trails. Um, I think that it would be great to do. My, my, my only sort of fear is that, you know, that you don't want to kind of tread uh, awkwardly over, um, you know, Indigenous stories, but, but, uh, but, you know, if, if I can find the right way of doing it, I'd love to. I mean, I'm not going to say that, you know, the Aboriginal stories were all caused by aliens in a kind of Eric Von Daniken kind of way. Um, but there's definitely some stories to be told about stuff in the middle. I just find it such an amazing, inspirational part of the world because, and it's hard to really explain to people who haven't been there because you don't really get it from photographs, that it's like being on the surface of Mars or, you know, it's, it's, it's an extraordinarily unearth-like um, landscape. And, and that's so kind of magical and powerful a thing on the on the imagination. So you said you spent some time there. I'm only asking questions because I've been there a couple of times in the last couple of years in my long mm. road trips that I've been doing. Um, so how long were you there in Alice? Oh, uh, a week. Oh, so not too so long. I wasn't, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a. Uh, you know, I, I. I. I didn't settle for any kind of great length of time. But um, did you yeah, get a chance to get to Uluru? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't go up it for um, uh, reasons equally of um, sensitivity and uh, fear of heights. Yeah, 
when you're talking about that place that you can, places that you can't describe in photographs, so I find that with Uluru, you can look at yeah. it as much as you like, but there's something quite different about actually standing there under it. Uh, yes, yeah. it's, it's an incredible place. That um, yeah, Philip, I know you haven't been there. I keep saying you've got to go. Yeah, yeah, it's, oh, you it's, must. It's, it's on the agenda, but um, <laughs> I keep getting off to Europe every time. I can do, travel, but yeah, no, we um, the trip was planned for June, but my daughter's decided to take a road trip with her friends to Uluru, and uh, my wife and I worked out we couldn't go there before her because she's made all these plans. So <laughs> maybe maybe next winter. I was going to say I can totally understand it because I've never been to the Tower of London, and you, I meet people from overseas, and they're like, "Why haven't you been?" Because I'm, uh, I'm like, "Well, I've been there three well, times." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, you see, even I've been, been to Uluru. It's, it's, it's one of those yeah, things. <laughs> Shadow of the Daleks was uh, quite a collaborative story with uh, many different writers writing each individual episode, tying into one story. Unusually, you all got to read the the last episode before right. you began, so you knew how it finished. That doesn't usually happen too often, but um, how did you find that? Collab was there much collaboration, or did John just give you certain ingredients that you had to put into your story? Well, I got to really cheat on that because I was writing the first one. So I, I, I went off and I wrote it. I wrote it really quickly because as much as anything else, I was kind of going, I don't know what works around in the pandemic. So I, I just wanted to get that banked. And um, so I think mine was the second one to be written. So it was more that other people were kind of then, you know, I, I between between me and John, we kind of had like we tried sort of like either end of the of the string. And um, let sort of the people, so the people in the middle will have much more kind of complicated stories of how they managed to make that work. Uh, swapped a few emails with people in, in the early stages of kind of working out what people were doing, because I think I had an initial pitch that was too similar to what um, uh, possibly Johnny Morris was doing. And so I ended up going for the body line one. But I don't have as I don't have as interesting a take on that as people who were were stuck in the in in the middle of the um, oh god I want to say story centerpiece that's probably the wrong kind of metaphor to use you know what I mean it's pretty astounding when you think about that when the pand pandemic started there were the big fish were trying to work out how to do things and so they worked out you know what it was cast of five they just repeated over eight stories that was two months of monthlies sorted. But within yeah. months, they were running everything that you wouldn't even know anything had changed because they just knew what they were doing. So it was a lovely way of getting a stopgap in there as they were putting their thinking together um, and then yeah. going on with the full series. So your next story was actually um, part of the, one of the last of the monthly range. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Blazing Hour. Well... It's 10.25. Let's get this experiment underway. This planet is called Testament, the powerhouse of the human empire. You indigenous are always frightened of risk. But if you don't take the risks, you won't get the rewards. Safety is our top priority. He's frozen in the wall. That's a living person. I have to tell you, because I'm frightened. I think this energy boost is going to cause the most appalling explosion anyone has ever seen. But if anything went wrong with the technology... I really think we've had enough of your negative attitude. Don't be too hard on him. He's from off-world. I mean, look around. Does this seem to you like a safe form of technology? Testament is a completely safe source of energy. I won't be listening to any more of your opinions. You're a saboteur. All you deserve is summary execution. What we do here isn't about heat or fission. It involves the manipulation of time. Bending time. That's the secret of testament technology, like the Leveson jar. What do you know about time? Time was supposed to make me rich. The effect will tear the time stream of the atom apart. You won't be able to control it. You'll get an infinite replication. That atom repeated in every moment of its history. This will mean the end for everyone. You're running light bulbs off the forces of the space-time continuum. You're sailing into a storm and your boat isn't built strongly enough to stand it. The roof ripped open and the sky full of fire. Testament consumed in a blazing hour. Get it under control, Mrs. Ellison. I can't! The explosion is coming now, and nothing can stop it! Big finish. We love stories. No! Go away! 
Get away from me! Doctor! Blazing Hour had been pitched, and I think storylines by the time I did Shadow of the Daleks, but I hadn't I hadn't written it. I think, yeah, I wrote it, I wrote it afterwards. I still remember getting the getting the email from David asking me to do Blazing Hour. I was I was in production on a Joe Lysett show uh, for Channel Four in the UK and getting the scene line, just being super excited at the idea of doing four episodes uh, for Peter. Because Although Silver Nemesis was my first story that I saw as a as a as a viewer, and you always kind of think that like the Doctor who the incumbent Doctor when you start watching is your Doctor. For me, Peter was always the uh, Doctor, um, and I think uh, it's to do with my the way I particularly relate to Doctor Who, which is that when I was a kid. It was all it was the era of kind of 80s action movies and Arnie and Sylvester Stallone. And at a kind of a kid level, it was He-Man and Thundercats and things like that. And for for boys that were not kind of typically macho, sporty um, boy boys, um, Peter's Doctor was a different kind of hero. He was, you know, he was clean cut and beautiful and omnicompetent, um, but he was also intelligent and non-aggressive. And so things like that really, you know, he, he was the one that I really kind of connected with. And so the excitement of being able to write words and think, Peter Davison's going to be saying this. I write, you know, and, and being able to write TARDIS, interior. Uh, and things like that. That was that was tremendously uh, exciting. Initially, it was with Tegan and Nissa. That was revised to having um, Turlo, Mark Strickson, which was super because I've always been a, 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 a. I mean, for me, I love all of the Davison companion scenes, but especially the T, the Tegan Turlo um, lineup of um, season season uh, season twenty one, um, and. Was that pandemic related that you couldn't use Jennison and Sarah? Uh, don't know. Uh, very, very possibly. Um, uh, I know that Mark uh, recorded remotely from from Australia, uh, New, but I think that's New off Zealand. the point. Was it, was it oh, New, New Zealand? Zealand? Sorry. Mm. No, it's okay. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no New Zealand is out there. We know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just ask a, a question on the story uh, around yeah. that time? Uh, the miniseries Chernobyl was pretty big. Was that yeah. any influence on this story at all, with your thinking? Huge or? influence, yeah. Yep. yeah. I, I, I mean, the miniseries... So I've always been fascinated by Chernobyl. Uh, I, I have kind of little areas of news and history that particularly kind of preoccupy me. Watergate would be one. Uh, Robert Maxwell. Uh, Chernobyl is, is, is one that's right there in my... Uh, as a thing that I'm you know, fascinated by the kind of the scale of the devastation wreaked by kind of human greed and incompetence. Um, and so the, the, the TV show really kind of brought that back to kind of front of mind. And I was thinking, you've got to be great to do uh, a, a spin on this in that in that in that kind of time on a Doctor Who tradition where you can do like the prisoner of Zender or in the Androids of Tara, or 24 in um, in the new series, in the, in the uh, is it 43, 42? 42. 42, yeah. Um, to do that with, with Chernobyl for, for Peter's Doctor, and Peter, who is so good at being the kind of hero trying to do the right thing as terrible events unfold around him. And I think that's that's where I often kind of see his, his, his Doctor. And knowing that that will be kind of bleak, but to try and kind of aim for hitting that kind of Caves of Androzani sort of space, you know, modest ambition to write something as as in, in the same ballpark as yeah, as Caves, yeah, why not? Um, so, so that was what I tried to do. Whenever I'm whenever I'm writing one of these, I always uh, do my research in terms of steeping myself back in the original text of like watching episodes. Whenever I'm doing a river, I'll rewatch the same river episodes from, from the new series and 
the same with old doctors. I'll watch, you know, stories from from the class to, to get the voices right, to get the the sound of the characters in my head. So with this, it would have been it was the Awakening and Frontios that I was I was I was watching for the Doctor and Turlo. I was going to say you, you pushed Mark beyond anything he would have done on TV, and in terms of he really had to get his acting chops on to do some of the things you did to him. Yeah, what Mark? Hmm. I mean, I, I think he, he, gave, he gave an amazing performance, and I mean, you you really pushed Turlo and the bounds of that character a long way. Yeah, well, I think Turlo's such a great character because he's sort. I could never understand, and people often say, oh, it's, it's, he's hard to write for because once he stops being bad, there's not really anything he can do. And I don't think that's true necessarily because he can be, I think Turlo is a self-interested person who wants to do the right thing, but has those sort of competing urges in him of wanting to do the right thing, but also wanting to look after number one. And that constantly being a kind of a tension in the character and I think that means you can do kind of great stuff with him. So in, in Blazing Hour, he's sort of reluctantly becoming a hero because he's forced to become part of the, the resistance. But he's sort of not entirely comfortable with it and then feels very guilty that he, he receives credit for it towards the end of the story when the real hero to his mind has, has been killed in the, in the attempt to, to restore the situation. And the other thing I wanted to do was to um, knock him about a bit. I, I always think it's interesting in the stories when things get really kind of close to home for the companions. And it doesn't happen very often. I mean, there's the cliche of like spraining your ankle. But when you think about the impact of something like Sarah's blindness in the brain of Morbius and how that really rattles you in terms of the... Um, safety of the leads that you've come to know and love i wanted to try something like that which is why i incapacitated him for for the middle two two parts of the story it also it gave me that great cliffhanger um uh, i say great purely in terms of my satisfaction with it rather than you know <laughs> bigging myself up uh where turlo has a, 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 you know a kind of a stereotypically feminine uh role of kind of being there unable to move as the mon the monster uh, closes in on him uh, at the end of part two. Yeah. So to me, actually, the character of Cotola made sense when they made him a prince. When they actually made him royalty, you actually could yeah. be back reading, actually, actually being royalty, you can understand there's that slightly self-obsession, there's that slight um, belief in being better than others, there's also the confusion in terms of public responsibility and I'm always surprised that more writers haven't played up the whole royalty aspect of him, because we could, yeah, do, we could do one way. We could do one where he's Andrew. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go that far. <laughs> <laughs> so you come back and do another Missy you got in right back, and then um, once again from Blazing Hour, which is very bleak, like emotionally takes you to the ringer. Uh, you then come back to Missy, which is fun and light. In a dark period of history, um, mm. but, but in terms of you know, you've got the monk, you've got the um, uh, you brought back the nun. Um, yeah, so how how did you come about writing that? And once again, is that another period of history that you've got passionate about, or were you asked to write from the, the Borgia's point of view? Um, I mean, it's just to, to actually, to some extent, no to to both of those, but I can explain why 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 it's set there. I mean, Blazing Hour and Shadow of the Daleks were kind of consciously sort of me pushing myself out of my comfort zone or the things that I feel I can I do sort of naturally to try and kind of go, well, what are you going to write if you're not relying on jokes? How are you going to make this thing work relying purely on thrills and spills and um, and things like that? So to, in, to some extent, Two Monks, One Mistress is a reaction against that and kind of going, okay, well, this one, you're just going to kind of really let yourself go. I mean, one of the nice things about um, Big Finish is that it allows me to kind of, it allows, it can allow me to do two things as part of the process. One is to kind of find a home for stories that haven't worked anywhere else um, in the sense of, if I've been trying to write something about body line and it, I've got that, that story material in my head to hand, there can be a Doctor Who application of it that can kind of come out subsequently. 
and the other thing is that I can use it to kind of experiment with things that I wouldn't necessarily try in other places. And so while Two Monks or Mistresses is, 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 is full on funny from me, uh, or at least it's attempting to be, it's also a chance for me to really, was a chance for me to explore writing farce and to see how I coped with that, whether I enjoyed doing it and how successful it seemed to be. And I'm working on a fast now, a play that, that has a direct kind of lineage to Two Monks on Mistress. And, and, and without the kind of learning that I've done through writing that story for Missy, I, I wouldn't be in the same position as I am working on the current play. Now, why it's, why it's where it is, uh, it, it, it actually comes from a, a, another play. Um, this is a play I wrote for Miles Jutt, um, The Life I Lead, which is about um, the life of David Tomlinson who is the actor who played Mr. Banks in the Mary Poppins film. And that, that went on in pre-pandemic. I can't remember many years pre-pandemic. 2019. Remember what it was like in 2019? Different the world. world. <laughs> yeah, where there were theatres. There were theatres for one thing. So we had a play in 2019. You know, it did good business. We had a nice we had a little run in the West End, which was incredibly exciting. Yes. That was a sort of a bit of a kind of a career high point um, for me. But the directors on that, we had two directors who were massive aficionados of the Commedia dell'arte. So that particular kind of Renaissance uh, Italian at farce. And one of them had worked on a lot of the physical business in One Man, Two Governors, the, um, the James Corden uh, show that played in the UK in the, in the mid-2010s. And so when, this, when the Missy box set came up, I said, oh, I'd love to do a Commedia dell'arte inspired piece so it's in that period because that was the period when those things yep. were written and, and and to put it in that period rather than like what man two governments does setting it somewhere else i thought removed a layer of complication about it to kind of go okay it's going to be like one of those plays in their original texts it's in the commedia dell'arte and, and and um missy spells that out in the kind of the 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 opening scene it's not it's not Shakespeare. It's not English verse. It is. It is in that sort of Mediterranean uh, comedic tradition. It, it, hopefully, I then sort of picture it as a sort of a, a, a missy riff on on one man two. I use one man two governors as a point of reference because for English audiences, it's the best sort of known example of that kind of uh, show. What I hadn't. I think fully got my head round or noticed even it was Matt that kind of really kind of pulled it, pulled it to my attention is that we were going to have a cast of people that had largely been in one man, two governors. So we had Rufus who taken over from James in, in the West end show. We had um, uh, Gemma who'd been in uh, one man, two governors as well. We had people who, you know, were, were doing a kind of a pastiche, uh, riff on something they'd done for real uh, <laughs> which which I, you know for me really added to the whole thing because you've got authentic performances they know the rhythms of that kind of show and they're playing it at that kind of pace and they're bringing it to life in in that kind of way um, so uh, everything sort of like came together uh, beautifully on that on that story now I know that not everyone likes that amount of comedy in their Doctor Who, but, you know, for those that do, I, 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 I hope it really kind of pays off. I was laughing out loud so the whole thing. Just, yeah. Missy cracks me up like so much. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and Rufus Hound is amazing. I mean, I think that the monk is the most amazing character. And once again, I, I can't understand why they haven't brought the monk back to TV. Because he's such a great <laughs> character in terms of yeah, yeah his his views um, yeah morally are just ambiguous. <laughs> but he's not outright uh, 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 evil, but he just does dreadful things. He just doesn't care. I think he's, yeah. he's such a yeah. great character to bring back. Yeah, I mean, I suppose like in some ways you could say that you could have taken Captain Jack in that kind of uh, direction. Had you had they not had Torchwood, you'd had just had Jack as a kind of a character in the main show. He could have he could have been that sort of time agent who kind of messes things up and uh, you know is is not sort of it's not bad, but kind of has a sort of an amorality. But of course, it didn't end up going going in that kind of way. But it's a, it's a lovely energy to have in the show yeah. to have someone who's ambiguous. 
in, 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 in how they treat history. And big finish of the cast so well with Rufus Hand and Graham Garden. I mean, two superb actors playing the monk. Um, a good, a good follow-on from Peter Buttersworth. Yeah, I mean, both the, both Rufus and Graham, I've worked, I've worked with um, outside of the show. Ru- Rufus, I did a extraordinary pilot for a radio show about, about a decade ago that never got anywhere. Where he, it was a panel show about the end of the world, and you had to kind of. Um, you, you scored points based on how many survivors you managed to retain in this apocalyptic situation. And it was, it was one of the most fun parts. And you know, watching it going, yeah, this is great. Nothing like anything Radio 4 puts out. <laughs> and it didn't, it didn't get made. And very much done, worked on um, Clue and, and, and all various sort of sketch uh, projects with. And it's, it's just, a, 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 I mean, I know I work with him more as a writer, but he's, he's just, I mean, he is a, a, a genuinely a living legend. I was fortunate to meet Graham Garner on a couple of occasions in Australia because the goodies are very huge down here. Rightly so. Because um, it was well, Doctor Who used to be shown every night and so it was the goodies. And so you'd watch the goodies at 6 o'clock and then Doctor Who at 6.30. And so that was just every evening for years. And they just kept repeating over and over again. And they, they, it was interesting because I, I um, watched a few unedited goodies episodes recently and went, oh, like, because I mean, our senses cut out a lot of the adult content stuff which yeah. is actually there's actually some pretty big adult content which there's quite we, a few boobs yeah but well we, i wouldn't have known that until recently <laughs> but yeah. um and we actually had the goodies come out and they did some shows out here the, the, the three of them when they were still alive um came out and, and had sellout crowds coming to see them and they were just yeah mm. still still very clever very funny hey I, i'm not dead I'm just a brain in a jar, that's all. Well, that's not so much a jar. It's, it's more of a handbag. From Big Finish Productions, Missy, Series 3. What have you just stuck to my brain? Bulldog clip. Come on, room, room. Uh, that other, that woman, she... At the, the end, end of the day, day we, we all need a little regeneration. Because, because life's, life's too short. short. Regeneration. regeneration. A Richard, Richard Temple, Temple product. Richard Morris Temple, born the 2nd of February, 1957, died... Well, that's up to you. You're threatening me! Mm, smidge. So, the Borgias, remind me? Oh, honestly, how bad is your history? Why are we on this planet? To stop this war? The Calvor will prevail against the Vat. We always do. Well, this is marvellous. He's coming. He is a war seed. Uh, what do I call you? Hmm, the meddling nun? How can we be in the same place, huh? Aren't there laws against it? Why would that bother you? You're literally a time meddler. Paradoxes like this are what gets us up in the morning. Big finish. We love stories. And how did you get my brain out of my body? Telebiogenesis. Tele... Rude. In terms of Doctor Who, comedy in Doctor Who, I think de- most definitely there's a place there. Some of my favourite releases from last year were uh, the Missy box set, obviously. Then there was uh, the Rory, the Lone, Centur- the Lone Centurion. Mm. That was awesome. The Jenny box set. That, all those were full of comedy. And, uh, and some of my favourite episodes of TV, Doctor Who, are those early black and whites with, uh, with comedy settings uh like the gunfighters was obviously a comedy and uh the romans uh those yeah. kind of stories that absolutely have a place yeah, in, in douglas, douglas adams and what he brought and you know season 17 the whole thing 17. fantastic so totally i mean I, I i have a sort of a big a big extra okay this is going to seem extraordinarily pretentious and pseudo intellectual about doctor who but but that it's it's at its best when it's being written by people that love dickens <laughs> and if you look at that across across the whole the whole history of the show, you look at you've got Russell and Stephen who clearly love Dickens. You've got people Anthony Reed and Douglas in the seventies, Terence Dix, yep. and yep. and back to Dennis Spooner. People and so they're people who love epic melodramatic narrative that's filled with funny moments because that's what Dickens does. He gives you huge. Big, brightly coloured um, cliffhangers and... Creates great expectations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's jokes. There's yeah. there's funny characters. There's people yeah. who say extraordinary things. There's there's overblown, um, you know, there's... 
there's Garen and Unstocks in every Charles Dickens novel, you know. But and, even 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 the tragic characters are comic at times. Yes. Yeah. So the Miss Havishams and the yeah, I mean, you know, they they all have comedy moments as well, as well as bleakness and darkness. Yeah. yeah. So when when Doctor Who when Doctor Who stops being like that, uh, when it becomes too much about for me about like you know sci-fi novels or or comic comic books that, that you 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 get away from that kind of combination of the the funny and the melodramatic that is when it, it, it's the stuff i really like about the show i'm i am you know i love the graham williams era i i i, I love season 24 i love that i love it when it's when it's out there and silly but also big and dramatic yeah Okay, so I uh, came back for River. I think I said Missy before, I got that wrong. Um, second River visit. Um, once again, it, it was, a, I loved this story, but it was bizarre, the terror of the suburbs. Mm. In terms of, I, I adored the whole box set in terms of Liz Shaw and River Song together were amazing. Loving these two strong women being written really well, but you had this bizarre situation in terms of uh, I mean, to, to me, it was actually like Denton, uh, the town Denton from um, Rocky Horror Picture Show. But I guess it was a bit like yeah. separate, separate wives. And so it was this bizarre prisoner-like town that you created full of characters you could kind of recognize and then took us on a bizarre journey. And now, once again, was that, was that your brief or did you get a brief or did you just want to write something like that? How did you come up with that story? So my jumping off point for, for that one was to go... Um, it, it, it was from the point, my starting point was going, what do we know about Liz? And I feel like, I felt like on TV, Liz is one of those characters, a bit like um, Polly, and even to some extent Sarah Jane, where we really love them, but we don't know much about them or what they're, what they're really like, kind of beyond like what their job is, maybe where they live, like we we know we know we know that she's a scientist who comes from Cambridge, but we don't we don't know enormous an enormous amount about about Liz's backstory. And so I was kind of thinking, well, what could we do with it? What where, could we could we see where Liz lives? So that was that was the kind of the jumping off point. And then I kind of went, well, let's not see where she, let, let's have her be put in a kind of a domestic setting, and a very sort of seventies one. And I began thinking about. Um, Dominic Sandbrook, the, I, I don't know whether you get his stuff over there, he's a British um, social historian, and he writes great books about, um, that. he's written a series of books about, about the UK since 1956. And one of the things he talks about is the kind of the, um, the transformation of British domesticity in the 70s with things like the arrival of the microwave and the freezer, that, that suddenly housewives have oceans of spare time opening up and a new portfolio of foods they can make because suddenly cooking has become so much more convenient and less time intensive. So I began thinking, well, let's put Liz in that kind of sanitized sort of suburban 70s setting. It began then making me think of stuff like Stepford Wives, like Abigail's Party, yeah. um, The Good Life. Yeah. Um, she, it, I, I began to get a sense of the kind of the, the the world it could be and then began thinking, well, let's make the three the freezers the threat if they're a symbol of the, the new modernity. And that's a very new series kind of thing to do is to kind of make the make your thematic symbol also the kind of the location of the of the big bad. Um, it was a tremendously difficult one to write. I, I don't really know why, but it was the hardest to write of I think of all the big finishes that I've done. Part of it, I think, was that I realised how difficult it is to do the Seventh Doctor thing of having a character that knows what's going on and the audience doesn't, because you then really struggle to motivate them to get from scene to scene. And it made me realise why, like, in The Curse of Fenric, the Doctor just sort of randomly turns up in places he's got no reason to go anywhere. He knows what's going on. He could just wait until I'm in part four and sort it all out. Um, <laughs> and, so in, and so in Terror of the Suburbs, I was kind of going, God, I'm not going to get River to go to the golf course. Why would she go to the golf course? And so it was full of stuff like that. What it's also full of is kind of, it's a very visual story. I had lots of really nice pictures in my head. The lion 
um, walking down the suburban streets, the, the lawnmower roaring over the public address system, the, the East German um, shop, uh, shop putters throwing, you know, there, there's a lot of kind of nice, colourful images that I think really add to the kind of the fun bounciness of the story. It's not a very comedic story, but I think it seems more comedy than it than, than it is because it's got a lot of those kind of fun components in it. It's it, it's, it's rollicking, I think. Um, so I think it's I think it's a lot more fun to listen to than it, than it necessarily was for me to carve it out on the um, on the on the keyboard. How long does it take to, you to write an hour drama like that? So the process of kind of di- uh, putting it together in terms of the storyline, which is the kind of the hard work part of it for me, can take ages. And fi- it's often a case of sort of finding bits of time here and there to work it out. I, I-, I want to get to the point where I have like a very detailed scene by scene action plan of how the story is going to be before I sit down and start writing proper. And then writing proper, I, I try and aim for to do i try and aim to do uh, 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 about 5000 a day during that actual kind of scripting process so for how long does a script about 10000 words is a... yeah for an hour yeah yeah so if everything's working well like two months one mistress that worked well that was two days for the first for that first draft and then a, a polish on the on the third day but ri- yeah river went on went a, a long way kind of over that <laughs> process. So doing doing a drama, a lot of that's all your planning, plotting it all out, making sure things make sense, solving problems. But that's all done. Hopefully, that that is all done before I start writing. How do you write comedy? Oh God, I mean jokes. Yeah, uh, jokes. Jokes is jokes is an empty page and a lot of pacing and fretting and. Um, what you have with jokes is the kind of knowledge of jokes you've told before that have made people laugh and the knowledge that you've, you know, that, that confidence that you can probably come up with something that's going to be funny. I know people that write jokes and will write like setups and then work out how to finish them off and be funny. I have to kind of think of the whole joke um, in my head before I can put it on the, on the screen. I can't, I, 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 my mind doesn't work that way of kind of doing a bit of it and then finishing it off. So, the, so the, the the comedy process and the drama process are totally different. The joke writing process of, of comedy is totally different. I mean, writing sketches is or, or sitcom scripts is kind of more more akin. When I'm writing a Doctor Who, I'm not I'm not generally working out the jokes in advance. I'll have a couple of jokes in my mind, but the jokes are kind of unfolding as I go, and they're like how I'm rewarding myself as I'm writing. Really, I'm kind of going through that. Oh, that's a funny thing. I'll put that in, and. Um, and and it just kind of takes it takes shape that way. Whereas writing jokes for for comedians or for a for a comedy show is much more a kind of a, a cold face operation, hammering at hammering at a hard unyielding surface until something falls out of it. When do you know you've got a good piece of writing, either a good joke or a good script? See, I have my own internal gauge, but that that doesn't necessarily relate to how it's perceived by the world at large. Um, <laughs> well, because you, you can have a joke that you think is really good and other people don't laugh at at one level, or you can have a whole show that you've kind of done and you think, yeah, oh, that's a really good piece of work. And it just doesn't really kind of land with anyone. I've, I've had like really good notices on for TV stuff where I thought it was not perhaps our best stuff and things that I thought were really, really great that have kind of, you know, slipped, slipped by the wayside. Um, uh, even at a big finish level, I think I think p- people really like Terror of the Suburbs, and I, I had, didn't see this. I didn't feel like there was the same kind of like uh, excitement for Hunting Season, which I think is a much better script in terms of what I've done. Now, any other elements of I don't know, um, but in terms of my judgment of my own work, um, I have a, I have a reasonable sense. I think of like when I've done, of, ha- of I have a reasonable sense of me relative to me, and I know what what for me is good. Well, now, what for me is good, for Russell, is going to be, you know, poop. But, but, but for me, that's not always kind of the, the, the same way it goes down in the, in, in the world large. It's just one of those things. From Big Finish Productions, The Diary of River Song, New Recruit. 
I know what you're going to say. Really? She is highly qualified and comes with excellent references. Who recommended her? The doctor. What harm am I doing? Trespassing and disturbing the dead. River! <gasps> uh, don't worry. I'll give it a friendly little zap. Digging? Oh. That's the least archaeological digging I've seen since my husband took a forklift to the ruins of Troy. Oh, nothing to worry about. Do I know you? Yes. Oh, but don't worry. It'll come back in time. I'm Dr. River Song, and I'm moving in with you, Miss Shaw. That was outside. Quickly. Oh, you could just buzz off. Hold on. Oh, oh. River. I won't leave me alone. Always good to find new uses for the old trowel. Oi, you can't go down there, Stainrush. I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean it. It could be deadly down there. Move. It's no good. I can't shift them either. Oh, sometimes it's best to admit defeat. Well, I never do. Not underground. The location identifier on the Vortex Manipulator isn't accurate enough. I told you. Shoddy and slapdash. We might materialize inside the wall of the mine. It would be instant death. Come on. Big finish. We love stories. Are you wearing pajamas? Uh, yes. Would you rather I wasn't? Well, it's Mr. Hunting season. How did you come to write for the... Uh, I'm going to make sure that I get the right doctor. Ninth doctor. That was it. Can, can I just say... Can I just say before you before you head to that, um, I'm noticing that you're that you're being inspired by various things like Rumpole, by plays that you like, uh, by Stepford Wives, things like that. With with the hunting season, I definitely got a sense of uh, inspiration of Downton Abbey. So, uh, it, to return to kind of big theories about Doctor Who, one of my big things is that you get great Doctor Who out of jamming unlikely things together. So you can jam Ron Paul of the Bailey into the end of the world and you'll have something fun. You can jam um, Downton Abbey into a space Western and you can have a kind of a fun, a fun thing. And it's, it's, it, it's a sort of a cut and shunt um, uh, approach to Dr. And, and Robert Holmes was, was, was the sort of the, the supreme genius of it. But Russell is, is, was also is something that he does a lot. Um, so yeah, hunting scene. Yeah, I I cannot bear Downton Abbey. Uh, I don't mean any offence to. Uh, I've got a friend who was in it. Uh, <laughs> he won't mind. Uh, oh, who was uh, that? <laughs> uh, uh, Paul Copley, um, who's the the doctor in uh, Downton Abbey. Was, yep. uh, I've worked with on a number of things. Great, yep. great actor. Yep. Um, but but he, um, it's uh, my wife loves it. And so it's, it's that 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 has more to do with it with it being a thing than, than than any of its own sort of own own faults. But for me, it's really inextricably uh, bound up in David Cameron's Britain and that particular kind of sense of sort of things getting worse and posh people suddenly being everywhere and are oh, just finding it sort of unbearable as a <laughs> as a thing. So. When when the email came round saying um, we think we can get Chris um, and have you got any ideas that will make him you know get ha might might really tickle his fancy not not I think necessarily help get it over the line but just kind of make the whole proposition as creatively exciting for him as it can be knowing about about Chris's politics. Um, uh, I, I knew that something that was about kind of egalitarianism and about um, uh, standing up for the downtrodden and um, the underclass and things like that would, 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 would probably kind of appeal to him. Um, so that was part of the part of the, the pitch for the hunting season. And to me, it was, it was putting together Downton Abbey, which I to do to do a sort of a bit of a hatchet job on on Downton Abbey. Um, where where the posh people aren't nice and cuddly and altruistic, they're spiteful and unpleasant and, and and out for themselves. And to mix that with something else I love, which is Clint Eastwood westerns, and to have the Doctor be the man with no name uh, riding out to talk to the uh, the cowboys and protecting the settlers on the homestead, which is the other side of the hunting season. Uh, I thought would make for a fun thing. And the other thing to say about that story is that 
a lot of the time I want to try and do more than just evoke the spirit of the era that I'm writing. I want to do something that's kind of like that, that is about something or says something to the audience about something bigger than just Doctor Who. But with the hunting season, it's the closest I think I've come to kind of going, okay, let's just really evoke the spirit of 2005 again, because it was a series that kind of meant so much to me. It was the first chance that Big Finish had had to do that era. And it, and so it was, it, there is a kind of conscious thing of like, if, if, if Russell had done more episodes of that series, what, what with Christopher, what, what, what would it have been like? And so that's, that's a part of that, that story's DNA as well. Well, it felt like, it felt like I was sort of one of these people privy to this big secret in you fandom that, 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 that Chris was, Chris was going to be doing it. And it, that was, that was quite a thrill, but, but it was a thrill, but also a terrifying thing while writing it. I think, God, I can't mess this up. <laughs> this one has got to be, this one can't be a, no, nah, it's all right kind of story this has got to be a really a really good one and and for me i, I yeah i i i i'm i'm bla- uh, um hunting season is 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 one of my absolute favorites of the of the, of the ones that i've done so mm. i mean I, th- I think big finish brought back i've said elsewhere previously that's i think the way that big finish brought back chris was very clever in terms of having a very convoluted complex story for him to start with which was nicholas briggs three episodes but you have to listen several times it's quite timey-wimey and it's one, well, and Nicholas often, Nicholas often writes like that. How Nick writes, but then the second box set was a bit more traditional in terms of future, past, um, present, which which was a bit more what people expected. But I think the two together actually, you know, strengthened Chris's return in a nice way. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who: The Ninth Doctor Adventures, Lost Warriors. <laughs> Do you suppose it's safe to be out of doors? Safe now, I should think. They only seem to come out at night. The stranger stared at the sheriff. What? 1925? Come on, I can't be far out. Look at the state here. Look at the state of us. 1925? Why do you keep saying that? I want to talk about your butler. Stratton. Something moves in the nest. Don't look at it. Hello, ladies. <gasps> No. I do beg your pardon. I am Queen Cruach. Oh, you're much more than that. You're Lady Macbeth. Tell this demon to leave her home. Curse that. Tell her to get out of here. She's well, we've attracted an audience. The pitchfork kind. I'm not afraid of you, blue man. I know what you bring, and I know your limits. Oh, I'm glad someone does. And the doctor. Doctor. Yeah, now, stand still, cos if that thing turns nasty, I don't want it to take your feet off. And lights. Roll camera. Actors, go. Look at it, the pinnacle of silent film. As opposed to what other sort? Your machine man. By me, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Herr Lang, I promise you will not regret this. You're making Metropolis. <laughs> of course. Everyone knows this. Fantastic. Fritz Lang. Actual Fritz Lang. I've got a knack. I'm good with lost things. I'm sure you are. Lovely and shiny. You will be like us. Good God. <laughs> Kill Fritz Lang. Big finish. We love stories. I think a lot of thought goes into um, the structuring of these things. That's a good segue, unless you have more uh, on on hunting season to talk about to talk about snow because stranded, Definitely. you know, obviously has, has, has been years in the in the structuring and the kind of the thinking of of how it would uh, how it would all unfold. So uh, yeah, so uh, actually, so the next one, Tommy Rose for Paul McGann, but he's got an amazing crew of people and actors working with him at the moment, um, mm. and particularly his companion. Snow for me was really stood out and was quite mind blowing because of the emotion behind it. I mean, this, this, as I said, one of the things that you stood out early for me in terms of your first stories, in terms of they were very funny. Then you took us on a different, different sorts of journey with some of the other episodes. With Snow, you took us to a very, very deep emotional place. Um, I'm just wondering where, why, why that, and how did you get us there? There is comedy in in, in, in Snow, but it's I, 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 I've stuck I stuck it all on Andy. Um, 
Tom, <laughs> Tom is a Tom is a is, is a friend. I, I knew he would be able to kind of um, do the uh, do that part of it. So so Andy sort of spends a lot of time trying to light, basically lightening the mood um, by being foolish in the corner. But yeah, in general, the tone of it is quite melancholic. I guess um, there were two things that kind of went into to snow. First was. I really steeped myself in, in, in Stranded before coming up with a story because I wanted to make sure that for, for those that have been following that, that, that range from the start, at least from this, the start of this, this strand of it, excuse the pun, would be satisfied by what I added. And I was very struck particularly by uh, John's I think it was John's story about the, the the zoo animals in the first um the first volume about telling a Doctor Who story in a way that really kind of got away from the conventions of the format. And we often talk about how your Doctor Who story can be like anything, but actually there there are a lot of conventions to Doctor Who in uh, in, in in terms of defeating uh, baddies the re- nature of the reveals the fact that you you give the aliens names like one of the things in the snow was not named the snow I, I didn't want to give the snow a it is called the 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 volbran or you know so it was it was uh, I, I wanted it to be all a bit more vague than that and then the doctor doesn't the doctor doesn't have a uh, face down of the of the threats he doesn't his process of dealing with it is to come to an understanding of what it is rather than to combat it or, you know, chase it away. The snow stays at the end. It's, it's still kind of part of, part of uh, Ron's, uh, Ron's ongoing uh, life. The other of those two things that really went into snow was I always, I, I, I've been saying it's, it's, it's like, um, it's quite like a pincer play in that it comes from a single kind of visual image. And it, it was the visual image of a garden into which snow is falling and there be no, being no snow falling outside the garden walls. I talked about how um, Terror of the Suburbs is filled with kind of like big visual images. And I think maybe too many, but the, the snow has got one I think really good visual image, which is, which is that one. And it was kind of extrapolating a story from that. I'm going, well, why is that happening? And what does that mean? And the explanation that I came up with in narrative terms is that the snow is attracted by the grief of the person in the house, uh, which is wrong. And so then that became a kind of a way of talking about grief and Whenever you're talking about something like that, you're talking about it, you're talking about your own personal experience of grief in some ways, but you're trying to make that kind of universal. And this comes back, I guess, to Richard Curtis, actually, which is being willing to kind of tackle very simple but very powerful emotions and not thinking that talking about very simple, very powerful emotions is dumb or redundant, but that they are kind of fundamental to human experience. Grief is um, a part of life. I think Avon says that in Blake 7. (laughs) But um, grief is a huge part of life, and um, this is a kind of a way of talking about it, and, and hopefully a way of not kind of leaving people on too much of a downer. I, I, I kind of realised with Snow that I do reset button on it, but the reset button doesn't invalidate the story. Uh, all the, all the, the story, emotion. No, because, yeah, exactly, because the story is about the emotion. Mm. The story is about the emotions that, that Liv feels and that that particular Ron feels, and those emotions aren't cancelled out by the fact that the events didn't happen mm. because that's what, that's what the focus is. Um, I've, I sometimes sort of feel when you have like kind of reset buttons in stories on TV, you can be kind of a little bit dissatisfied about it. I, I, I'm watching a lot of Next Generation at the moment and that sometimes happens. But I think with that, you're kind of going, well, it's because I'm not, I'm not invested enough in what's happened to the characters in that process. But I think if you, if, if what is happening to the character in that process is incredibly powerful and emotional, then that's, 
fine, then that's then that's absolutely dramatically valid. Uh, heaven sent. I can't remember which way round it is when those in those episodes, but you've got the episode where Capaldi is in the castle. Um, and Hellbent. Hellbent, okay, and it ultimately mean, means that that Clara is alive again. Now you could see Clara being alive again as like a kind of oh, it's a bit of a cheat. Oh, they've undone that. But actually what it's about is Capaldi's doctor going through that incredible wrenching process of get dying over and over again because what he's doing is so important. And that's the, that's the point of the, of the drama. I think, I mean, I mean it's, it's a wonderful story in script. Nicole Walker is spectacular. And yeah. the, the, the way she conveys the emotion, the truth, and just the pauses i mean i think the thing to me just the, the end is just the thing about the thing about grief is, is just waiting and just needing to pause and that's what happens so much at the end of that script there's just so much space to allow the characters to to breathe and to grieve and yeah, yeah there, there is an upturn at the end but even, even as i said even though it's a slight a slight reset it doesn't be set for ron um there's a slight reset for uh, leave it doesn't still stop the fact that she's been through it and she expresses that yeah. at the end of the story yeah it, it was a very powerful examination of grief i mean she's such a wonderful actress so i i talked earlier on about bringing my queer as folk uh fanboy uh thing to the t- 2005 series but i'm a massive uh nicola walker uh fanboy i mean um the uh Last Tango in Halifax. I don't know yeah. whether you guys have yeah, that. Yeah. She's, she's, yeah, she amazing. is just brilliant. And especially the two-hander scenes between her and Sarah Lancashire. I, I don't think there's writing or performance to match it in or out of who um, in, in, the, in the last uh, decade or so. And um, also really uh, love her in, in the split, the, um, the, 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 the lawyer drama. And so... One of the big attractions for me of Stranding was the chance to write something for for her character. And the, the part of the brief from, from Matt was can we can we have some some juicy stuff with 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 Nicola and, and Tom Price? And so that informed some of the choices, but but I then kind of took that on to, to really making it quite a sort of a a live a live-centric piece while still hopefully giving giving Paul McGann enough um, fun things to do. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Eighth Doctor Adventures, Stranded Three. I am on an alien planet. Cup of tea? We're on the edge of the known universe, and you're putting on the kettle. Home comforts, embrace it. Like, I've seen extraordinary things popping up in the most ordinary of places, but now I'm here in the most extraordinary place I've ever visited. I kind of just want to do ordinary things. Are you sure this is a good idea? I wish people wouldn't keep asking me questions like that. It's starting to get demoralizing. I don't want us getting complacent. That's a dangerous thing to become right now. Rhythm, routine, that's what'll see us through. All extraterrestrial phenomena are the exclusive property of divine intervention. Something is wrong. Run! We'll take the TARDIS, and we'll take this place. You will not, you vicious minx. We're not settling the bill in a restaurant. We're playing with human history. We're not playing. I take human history very seriously indeed. That's the thing with time travel. Things change, and once they're changed, they stay changed. Something came through the letterbox. Down. Ah! Big finish. We love stories. So your most recent contribution that's been released is uh, you finally got to your Blake 7 car park yeah. scene and uh, managed to do the, the fanboy thing that I've always loved to, wanted to know is what happened to Jenna after she left the Liberator. So do you tell us about um, how you came to write for Blake 7 and what, what, yeah, was it, was it what, all you expected? Yeah, well, such, such is the kind of order of these things. Um, I, I think I wrote Stimulus Response uh, before um, uh, the latest river or or um, snow, uh, I think that's. I think I read it after hunting season. Um, <laughs> it would have been the start of twenty twenty one. So I, I associate it very much with kind of like now, very very cold mornings and waiting for the heating to come on in my office. So it was David that 
that that asked me, do you know anything about Blake Seven? Well, yes, I absolutely do. Um, my wife also loved Blake Seven. We 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 met. Uh, one of the things that got us talking the first time we met was was Blake Seven. Um, so it's kind of part of our part of our family heritage, uh, as well as uh, my own sort of uh, enjoyment. I was sort of going, well, you know, I sort of said as kind of sensitively as possible, um, you know, who, who, who's going to be in the cast? Because um, obviously it's a show that's suffered a lot of kind of losses um, in the last um, few years. And um, between David and Peter kind of explained, Peter Angelides explained the, um, explained the premise of the worlds of Blake Seven kind of idea. And, and Blake Seven has such a distinctive kind of tone of voice that I think is partly, it's a fusion of Terry Nation and, and, and Chris Butcher in their, in their kind of... Um, it's a kind of sort of macho camp that is very influenced by kind of westerns and gangster movies, but really has its tongue in its cheek. And I kind of thought, okay, I can see how you could actually make that work with all new cast. You could you could have something that's authentically Blake Seven, but with but with none of the original characters. Now, I have the advantage of having uh, Sonny Nevet in, in 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 this, who is glorious and. As as I as with Mark in the Blazing Hour, there was a chance to give a really good actor some more stuff they necessarily been given to do on TV, and that's I'm not criticising uh, 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 Chris Boucher or Terry Nation on uh, for that. It's it's partly a reflection of the times and partly a reflection of having a large ensemble cast where you've got. Gareth Thomas and Paul Darrow, and you want to give them lots of stuff to do because they're Gareth Thomas and Paul Darrow, and what they're doing is a kind of an amazing sort of homoerotic power struggle in space. And why wouldn't you want to watch uh, as much of that as possible? Um, but this, this is like this was a chance to kind of yeah, really, really have some fun with Jenna, and um, and and do some do some political stuff. I, I love um, political stuff. I'm a, I'm a kind of a political animal. Like you know, I've I've um, I've written a lot of jokes for politicians in my time, and um, I follow political news a lot. And I um, Blazing Hour is is very political. Um, so is Stimulus Response. Um, Sally and Event is very political too. When we spoke to her, she wasn't hiding back her politics either. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think there's there is a lot of that. There is a lot of that in 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 in, in showbiz, um, and there's a lot of that in these particular shows too. I mean, not so, I mean to some extent, Blake Seven, although it, you, on the surface it's more political because it's about um, you know uh, oppression and rebellion. But Doctor Who is you can ha- you can have a kind of a right wing take on Doctor Who, but you're do- you've got to do something that's you've got to be really reaching for it because. It's like Christianity. You can have a kind of a right wing take on Christianity, but Christianity, like Christianity, you're, you're always, you know, you're onto a winner when you're starting sentence. Christianity, like Doctor Who, but <laughs> but but bear with me. Christianity, like like Doctor Who, it is in in essence, it has a sort of a left wing uh, slant. It's kind of it's about you know people, it's someone someone fighting an impossible fight on behalf of the kind of the the. The, the 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 little the people, the, yeah, yeah, the against fist. against the kind of the big forces. I mean, I'm I would say that I'm more centrist than Doctor Who is um, as a, as a rule. I think I'm I'm in the kind of Terence Dix camp of kind of being quite sort of liberal about these things. Kind of going, well, yeah, but you can't make the show anything other than what it is, <laughs> and what the show is is uh, is is inherently kind of subversive of the establishment and kind of punching back for punching back for the downtrodden. But, but I've got off, I've gone back to Doctor Who. Blake, Blake Seven. Um, Blake Seven even more so, yeah. Yeah, and this this story is this story is about kind of uh, hard hard politics and, and really exploring what that would mean. That it's taking that discovery at the end of Shadow, which is that the Terra Nostra and the Federation are two sides of the same coin and saying, how would that work at ground level? That's the jumping off point for the story. 
and so it's seeing this planet that's that's i can't remember what the planet's called the planet had a different name uh during the writing process and we'll change it at the last minute i can't remember what it's called now but th- that that planet has uh a president who is in the process of realizing that he's a puppet and that he has a problem with the terra nostra and he he's realizing that the terra nostra and the federation are our two sides of the same coin and how he's dealing with them and jenna's kind of caught in the middle of it she's she's got her own agenda and she's teamed up with uh you know that one can't be a a, a british sf fan without you know describing as homesian uh, <laughs> the kind of guy that she the kind of guy that she teams up with uh rax uh but but she's sort of reluctantly drawn into this story um the, the kind of the post star one Jenna, I, I sort of felt like I, could, I was able to have her kind of being, I was able to have her wanting to get away from the things that she's experienced on the Liberator, but unable to uh, get away from them. That every time I get out, they drag me back in kind of thing, because mm. the way that she now looks at the world as a result of traveling with, with Blake has changed her kind of mindset that's my kind of take on it it's not you know um it, it, uh, there wasn't a kind of a revised character biography for Jenna or anything like that this is just kind of how I how I thought I would kind of approach it and then there was some arc stuff to be put into Simulus Response which was about the um the Carl uh Hound character which I kind of sort of drafted for Peter and said will this work for you and he was like yeah that, that will that will that will pay off uh uh, nicely and can I do something with that character of Rax? And I was like, yep, do get t- take him, take him how you want. And and so that 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 had a nice little bit of um little bit of intermingling of the of the writers on that in, in that um on that box set. Yeah, I'm sure people enjoy it. So if people want to look at other stuff that you've done, what what, what other where can people go and see some of your other writing and work? Well, I mean, the thing that I'm proudest of is, is, is my play life I lead, which is in abeyance at the moment, but hopefully will 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 tour again at some point when when uh, theatres are open and Miles is uh, is inclined to uh, to trot it out again. Um, I'm always writing in television. Um, uh, where you see Joe Lysett, I, I I am generally not far behind. Um, and uh, I'm currently working on a new uh, series for Radio Four in the UK. Um, uh, called Whatever Next, and I can't say more about it, uh, much more about it than that. It's a comedy show. It will be coming out on Radio Four at some point this year, and on the BBC Sounds app through through throughout the wherever else wherever that gets to. Um, so so stay tuned for that. I'm currently working various comics, sort of directing some tours for the, for for this year. Um, but uh, I will probably be popping up in the credits of a comedy entertainment show. Uh, somewhere near you soon. Fantastic. I'm sure there's some more big fish, fish coming, but it hasn't been announced yet, so we uh, can't talk about it. Um, but looking forward to seeing what else this has come. Uh, the, the, it is not the end, and the moment has been prepared for. <laughs> James, thank you so much for your time with us tonight. No worries. My pleasure, guys. If we're going to make a deal, we need to start out by being honest with each other. I'm Jenna Stannis. Who are you? She's a terrorist. A freedom fighter? She's one of Blake's crew. Where is the Liberator now? We were separated after the war. I've got no part in any of it anymore. From Big Finish Productions, the worlds of Blake 7, the Terra Nostra. The Terra Nostra are here on Store Jaden. I shouldn't be surprised. They've got a presence on every colonized world. Have you dealt with the Terra Nostra before? It didn't leave me rushing back to repeat the experience. You must have made quite an impression. Let's just say it involves a big explosion and an awful lot of hard drugs. She resembles a known enemy of the Terra Nostra. Confirm that, and it will be excellent news. And a great opportunity for you. Yes, Enforcer. I won't make any mistakes. You certainly won't make any you'll live to regret. Sorry for keeping you. We had some business to take care of. So did I until you kidnapped me. Think of it as a rescue. The Federation are no friends of mine, Villa. Believe me, I have no interest in turning you over to them. Then what do you want? 
I want to offer you a job. A job? Villa's comrades crossed the Terra Nostra a while back in Space City. How did you know? Villa Restor. Who wants to know? You hurt. I'll live, unless your enforcer has other plans. As a matter of fact, he does. Oh. And what's that? Retribution. Just my luck to bump into you again. There's no luck about it. I think you're taking the whole puppeteer thing a bit literally. You can't see it because you're too close to it. You're involved. You all are. I promise to make you rich if you bring me Rog Blake. You can predict what will happen if you don't. You'll withhold my contract fee. I was going to say your head on a spike, but yes, that too. <laughs> Not your style. You prefer a clean kill. Try me and see. Any progress? That's what I came to tell you. Villa Restel has arrived on Space City. Hello, Hinton. Jenna, I didn't expect to see you. Lucky for you that I had unfinished business on Space City. Oh, I can't wait to see Avon's face when you come back on board. He'll be trying to reach his friends, but when he does, we'll be waiting. Big finish for the love of stories. This is Immy Pack. You can use it to choose when your victim dies. Just like the Liberator crew. They're all marked for death. Okay, so that was a trailer for Terra Nostra, or The Terra Nostra. Uh, if you haven't heard that yet, something from the worlds of Blake 7, definitely grab that. Actually, it's sort of a trilogy of box sets that you can jump into any of them. Starts off with the Clone Masters. The second set is Babe and the Butcher. And this one, the Terra Nostra. They all have an interconnecting arc, uh, but you can jump into any of them too, if you so desire. So I'd really recommend these. They do a fantastic job on them. They do indeed. Fantastic. I'm really enjoying the worlds of Blake 7. As far as recommendations for this week go, I'm just going to put an asterisk and say all of the above. Have a listen indeed. to everything we've talked about on today's episode. Uh, we've got selections from the Blake 7 universe, as we just said, River Song, Unit, The Ninth Doctor, The Eighth Missy. Doctor, Missy. There's much more to come from James as well. Some very exciting stuff. So uh, look forward to everything that's coming out of the pen of James Kettle. Anything further to say, Philip? <laughs> no, I, I am um, at all the time. Thank you, Dwayne. <laughs> all right, we'll be off. We'll catch you next time on the Sirens of Audio. See you guys. See you, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 97, Whoever Next, with our guest James Kettle and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Contact details. Links to our podcast and video locations, social media and more can be found at sirensofaudio.com. And if you find your TV viewing going off the boil, grab yourself some James Kettle Audio Plays. They'll have you steaming for more. Hey, I can say dad jokes like that with a name like mine. I can, honest. Because audio drama 